to us about pundit reasoning in higher order uncertainty. Um, this is a single author paper. So actually, if you have questions, perhaps uh, just unmute yourselves rather than using the chat. If you prefer to use the chat, I will uh, I will read the questions out to her. Um, we also have two panelists, uh, Paolo Barelli and Marciano Siniscalchi, who we thank for uh, being here. Um, I just want to remind you that this is recorded. Um, we're recording this. And also that uh, next week uh, we have uh, Douglas Bernheim from Stanford, and he's going to talk about who controls the agenda, controls the polity. Okay. So, William, and you have uh, an hour from now, and the screen is yours. Well, thanks so much for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. And it's also a pleasure to see what Max comes up with um, uh, in terms of the uh, the poster. And he's done a great job again. Um, so let me just jump right in. Um, so high order beliefs, beliefs about beliefs, play a central role in game theory. So here's an example that might be familiar to you from uh, the global games literature, but there are, there are many others. There's two players and they can choose either to invest or not invest. And their profits depend on the level of economic activity, which can be either high or low. And if the level of economic activity is high, the game is a coordination game where they both want to invest if the other invests, but not otherwise, um, or they don't want to, uh, um, or they don't want to invest if the other doesn't invest. But if the level of economic activity is low, uh, then it's a dominant strategy not to invest. Now in situations like this, Profit uh, uh, Anne's optimal decision, of course, depends on what she thinks uh, the level of economic activity is. So her optimal decision depends on what we call her first order belief. But because Bob's optimal decision likewise depends on what he thinks about the level of economic activity, Anne's optimal decision might also depend on uh, what she thinks that Bob thinks. And that's what we call her second order belief. But likewise, Bob's optimal decision might depend on his second order belief. So that might mean that Anne's optimal decision might um, depend on her beliefs about Bob's beliefs about her beliefs. So her third order, fourth order, etc. Now you might reasonably ask, well, are real players actually able to reason about these high order beliefs? And the answer is actually not so clear. So here's an example from everyday life. If you and I have eye contact, well, then we both know that we have eye contact and we both know that we both know it. And we know that the other knows that I know that I know that the other knows, et cetera, et cetera. So in a situation like this, reasoning about high order events is actually easy. It seems like we can reason up to infinity. But in other cases, it seems much harder. So here's an example from a psychology paper. And in this paper, they ran an experiment where uh, subjects had to read simple stories about characters like Sarah, Joe, Mrs. Jones. And then afterwards, uh, they had to answer questions like this one, whether statements like these were true. So Sarah hoped that Joe would believe that she didn't know that Joe knew what uh, Mrs. Jones thought about her. And reasoning about these kinds of sentences turns out to be really difficult um, for subjects even though they uh, involve only five orders of beliefs uh, as opposed to the infinite orders of beliefs in the eye contact example. So it seems like some high order events are easy to reason about, but others are difficult. So why is that? Well, it very much depends on the context so, and, uh, what, and in particular, what is transparent to the uh, players. So in the eye context example, there's a context, and in this case, actually a physical situation that makes it transparent to the players that they both know that they have eye contact, they both know they both know it, and so on and so forth. Um, and that means that um, with this particular context, the high order event that we uh, have eye contact, we know we have eye contact, we know that. The other knows it, we know that the other knows that we know it and so on, can actually be reduced. It can be expressed in terms of a low order event that we can reason about. Because the event that we have eye contact automatically generates all these high order beliefs, which makes it easy for us to think about the event, uh, 
um, these high order events. Uh, Bill, I mean, uh, so in the spirit of keeping things lively, <laughs> yeah. let me ask a question, but feel free to shut me down or, you know, defer. So this still, um, it, it, you're, you're sort of implicitly assuming that it's costless to uh, leverage the fact that something is transparent to do this reduction from high order to low order. Yeah, that's a great question. Um yeah, I think what I have in mind is not so much that you're actually actively reasoned through it, but if you were asked, you would be able to um, to say whether it, it is the case. Or maybe a better way of putting it is actually you could condition your behavior on it. So I could condition my behavior on whether it's common knowledge that there's eye contact. So for instance, I might decide not to... Um, um, make a funny uh, face when we don't have uh, when we uh, when it's common knowledge that we have eye contact. So I guess that's formally what I'm assuming. So I can condition my behavior on a high order event, even though I don't actually go through the process of reasoning about all these events, uh, all these. Thanks. Yeah, so this idea actually goes back to uh, the work of the philosopher David Lewis and the linguist uh, Clark and Marshall in the 60s and 70s. And you can also find it um, in some form in uh, Almond's work on agreeing to disagree and also um, uh, Mondor and Samet's uh, later work. Um, but there's no um, game theoretic context that makes this dis uh, model that makes this distinction between high, yeah, easy and difficult high order events in the sense that uh, traditional game theory, of course, starting with the seminal work from Harzani, uh, assumes that people are perfect reasoners. So they have, uh, they act as if they have beliefs at arbitrarily high orders. And so um, uh, these ideal reasoners wouldn't have any problem with the Sarah and Joe example. And on the other hand, of course, we have the level K literature and the cognitive hierarchy literature. And um, they model players as if they uh, um, reasoning about some or up to some order K uh, is more difficult than uh, reasoning up to order K minus one. So they cannot explain why the eye contact example uh, that potentially involves like infinitely many orders of beliefs is uh, easier than the Sarah Joe example. Uh, so you might not care very much about eye contact, but uh, arguably uh, this kind of phenomenon is very important in economics. So the eye contact uh, example has a lot of similarities with the public announcement. So if there's a public announcement, we all know uh, the announcement, we all know that we all know it and so on. And these public announcements, of course, play a very central role in, uh, in game theory. So what am I going to do today? Well. Uh, I'm going to build on Savage's small world idea, uh, which is tightly linked to this idea of context. And I'm going to use it to model players with a finite depth of reasoning. And uh, even though these players have a finite depth of reasoning, so they cannot reason up to arbitrarily high orders, they are able to reason about high order events, provided they can be reduced to some low order event. Now, if we do that, we get new phenomena. So uh, context does matter uh, in, this, in, two, in at least two ways. So behavior is not monotone in the, uh, and in a way that I'll explain, but um, that the standard uh, framework satisfies. And it's also the case that there's no so-called terminal type space. Now, if you're not an epistemic game theorist, that might not uh, mean very much to you, but essentially terminal type spaces are typically used to show that working with type spaces is without loss of gener generality, meaning that we don't have to worry about uh, working with uh, belief hierarchies that can be very difficult uh, to use. So you might worry that if you introduce context into the picture, uh, you wouldn't be able to work with type spaces and instead you'd have to work with these uh, uh, belief hierarchies. But I'm going to show you that that's actually not the case. So you can still use type spaces because any situation that can be modeled with belief hierarchies can be modeled by uh, type spaces and vice versa. 
so the basic idea is very simple. Um, so um, suppose that there's uh, two states of the world. Um, so uh, in both states of the world, the economic primitive is high. So level of economic activity is high. And Bob believes that it is high. But these two states of the world differ in what Bob thinks that Anne thinks. So in the one on the left, Bob believes that Anne believes that the state is high. And in the one on the right, Bob believes that Anne believes that the state is low. So these are the actual states of the world, if you will. But now suppose that Anne doesn't think about what Bob thinks that she thinks. So then to her, um, she, cannot, she cannot make the distinction between those two states because she doesn't ask herself what Bob believes that she believes. So it is as if there's just, for her, there's just one big state. So you can think about it as there being some kind of actual state of the world, so a very uh, which in which uh, Bob does think about what Anne thinks, but then there's a subjective state space for Anne, uh, which lumps these two together. That doesn't make a distinction between uh, uh, states that differ only in what Bob thinks that Anne thinks. And this is precisely the small world idea of savage. So um, in savage's terminology, a small world is um, um, uh, describes a setting where a decision maker doesn't make very detailed distinctions about, uh, uh, doesn't make very uh, detailed distinctions between the st states of the world. And that's to be contrasted with a large world where, um, uh, the um, decision maker does make these detailed distinctions. And he notes that if you have a small world, so uh, where you don't make very fine distinctions between um, the different states of the world, uh, then a single state of the world corresponds to a, a set of states of the world in the larger world where you, um, you are making these fine distinctions. And that's, that's precisely the idea here. So the actual... Uh, states of the world are uh, do include Bob's beliefs about Anne's beliefs, but Anne has this coarse perception uh, of the state space, so she has a subjective state space where she doesn't make that distinction. So this is quite different from what we typically think of in, uh, as risk or uncertainty. So um, if there's risk, so uh, then and does distinguish the two states of the world. So in this um, uh, in this picture, um, she she distinguishes the two, but um, she doesn't know which one is realized. So she might, for instance, assign equal probability to each of them. And I'm interested in a situation uh, that's different in that she doesn't make the distinction. So she lumps them together. She doesn't ask herself which one has obtained. Mm -hmm which means that she also doesn't, yeah, she doesn't face this kind of uncertainty. She just um, assigns probability one to the big state. So um, it is as if Anne has this very coarse partition of state. So her subjective state space uh, is, a, uh, is a coarse partition uh, of the actual state space. And I'll be working with uh, sigma algebras to cover the general case. But uh, if you're more comfortable with partitions, you can just keep, uh, you can replace every instance of the word um, sigma algebra with partition. So, Wilhelmin, a, a question about this. Uh, and I, I know you're going to, you know, get back to this. So, but just to, um, what if at some point, and it, you know, because maybe she's, you know, reasoning adaptively or, or for whatever reason she she has to think about what and what what Bob thinks that Anne thinks mm -hmm. um, so then um what, what, how are we going to how are we going to how are we going to resolve that uh, and, and the reason I'm asking is because you know there is an an approach in, in in decision theory that that is you know similar to this where you you perceive a partition say of the state space uh, but but you are still aware that you're not that you don't know the whole picture. And so you're going to do something. And, you know, of course, we can have 
gazillion different theories about what that something is, but, but something that's going to take into account the fact that you're unaware, that you're aware of, of the fact that you're unaware to some extent. Yeah. This is not the awareness literature, by the way, that I have in mind, but you probably know what I'm thinking about. So I mean, the broader question is what, what's going to happen when N has to come up with such, such beliefs uh, or, or, yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. I'm actually, I don't actually model that. So in a way, it's um, uh, it's indeed as if, yeah, it's as if she's unaware that she could be thinking about Bob's beliefs more. Yeah, but I think in reality, indeed, if I face a game, then all of a sudden I might realize. Um, Could I ask you again because I, I I know you have an example coming, and ah. in that example, maybe there's an easier, way <laughs> okay. to, a clearer way to ask this question. Apologies. Go ahead. Okay, now sorry that I didn't uh, catch the, um, yeah, that I can't quite make the connection yet, at least. But uh, yeah, so please, uh, please do ask again. Yeah, so how can we put this into a standard framework? So uh, I'm going to talk about both belief hierarchies and types. So I'm going to start with belief hierarchies um, and then move on to types. Um, now, compared to the decision theoretic setups, one thing that we have to worry about is that we cannot choose these partitions arbitrarily because um, the way I choose my partition for one player is going to affect uh, what the other player is going to be able to think about because we think we have these uh, beliefs about beliefs. But at least in kind of like uh, the basis of the idea is very sim similar. So here's an example with four belief hierarchies for M. So in one, um, uh, the first one, uh, Anne assigns probability one to the state of nature being uh, high and that Bob believes it. In the second, Anne believes that the state of nature is high and that Bob believes that it's low and so on. Now, these are the actual states. These are Anne's actual belief hierarchies. But now suppose Bob has this coarse perception, so he doesn't reason about Anne's beliefs, about his beliefs, about uh, theta. Now, he is so assume that he is reasoning about uh, Anne's beliefs about uh, the state of nature, just not about what Anne thinks that he thinks. Now, then it is as if he doesn't distinguish between um, the, the belief hierarchies in red and the ones in blue, uh, so, uh, between the two belief hierarchies in um, red and between the two belief hierarchies in blue. Because both in in both the red in both of the red belief hierarchies for Anne, Anne thinks that the state of nature is high, and these two red ones only differ in um, what Bob believes that Anne believes. So if Bob doesn't reason about what Anne thinks that he thinks, he's going to lump these two together in his partition. And likewise with the blue hierarchies, uh, they differ only in what Bob believes that. Um, about uh, theta, so he's going to lump these two together as well. So he has a coarse perception of Anne's belief hierarchies, um, and we can. So I'm going to put that in the standard framework. So for now, I'm going to forget about uh, potential finite depth of reasoning. I'm just going to focus on the context. And the basic idea is that if you uh, there's a particular oh. sorry, I didn't catch that. I think no, no. Somebody unmuted themselves by accident. Go ahead. Oh, okay. So the basic idea is that if there's a particular context that fixes players' beliefs about the state of nature, the theta. So in the eye context right. example. Let me oh, sorry. Can, can I ask a question? Yeah. Maybe you're going to maybe you're going to explain this right now, but you're using the word context, and I I, I want the definition of it. Context yeah. is going to be what is going to be just the lumping of states. Is it is no. it what context means? Okay, go ahead. No, excellent. And this is indeed exactly the right point to ask that question. So thank you for that. Yeah. So here I'm going to make precise what I mean by context. And the idea is that the context fixes, yeah, imposes restrictions on the beliefs that players might have. So in the eye contact example, um, um, 
the fact that we have eye contact uh, already rules out certain beliefs. So we could be uncertain about all kinds of things. It could be that we're, uh, say, that you're trying to sell me uh, an item and we're uncertain about the quality, uh, about the quality of the item. Um, so there could still be uncertainty, for instance. But one thing is that is ruled out by that particular context is that we think that there's we don't have eye contact. So in that case, there's a physical situation that fixes our that imposes restrictions on the beliefs that we might have. So we rule out uh, that we think that there's no eye contact. So formally, what uh, what I'm uh, what it means is that the set of possible beliefs that we might have is a subset, potentially strict, from the set of all beliefs uh, about uh, the state of nature. So it's uh, the, uh, our first order beliefs, the HI1. Uh, so those are the first order beliefs for uh, player I, are a subset of the set of all possible beliefs about theta. Does that help? Yeah, yeah, I, I guess so. But let, let's let's continue because I'm, you know, in my mind, whenever we talk about context, we're, we're thinking we're, we're fixing a belief subspace. Uh, and that's exactly and what that... I'm doing. That's exactly okay. what I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah, so for this like first order beliefs, I'm not imposing any uh, restrictions beyond uh, a technical condition that I'm happy to elaborate on, but also happy to leave for people not interested in uh, the more technical details. Um, but of course, oh, sorry. Now the context could also impose restrictions on the uh, higher order beliefs. So in the eye context example, eye context example, uh, just imposing restriction on the first order beliefs is sufficient. But you could also say that um, um, first order beliefs are unrestricted, but then in the second order, uh, we rule out certain things a priori. So in general, uh, so the k plus one order beliefs, so uh, those are the beliefs about order k. Those are a subset of all possible. Uh, those are potent, those are a subset of all possible uh, k plus one order beliefs. Again, assuming that it's analytic, and then imposing standard restrictions uh, that we need in order to get well-defined belief hierarchies. Um, so these are also standard in the framework, a standard framework. And then what we end up with is like when we do that over all these different orders, uh, we get a set, of, we get a pair of subsets of potential belief hierarchies for both players. Now, an example of this, so I, I call this a model, an example of this would be the universal space from Mertens and Samir. And the Mertens and Samir space is a very special model in that it doesn't impose any restrictions on um, uh, players' beliefs. So it's in a way, it's a context-less context environment. Uh, Is it uh, clear what, um, so the, the way to think about context is the restrictions it imposes, like that are imposed a priori on these sets of kth order beliefs? No, no, that, that's clear. And that's the definition I had in my mind. I was, I was just wondering where, uh, you know, a finite. Uh, yeah, so I'm, yeah. It's going to come in, into the picture. That That's yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm going, to, so I'm going to add that now. So if you would work with infinite depth of reasoning, you could do the same thing. So th that's what I've just done here. Um, but then you wouldn't see the um, effects that uh, I'm going to shape you, show you later. So this is something that you could do also within the standard framework. Um, and in fact, the Merton Samir paper does do something of this kind. Um, but now, of course, I'm, go I'm going to combine it with uh, the idea that players can have a finite depth of reasoning. And that, that the, the finite depth of reasoning, those are going to be these coarse uh, partitions or coarse sigma algebras. Yeah, so what do I mean by uh, depth of reasoning? So just very informally, so belief hierarchy has a finite depth of reasoning or uh, corresponds to a finite depth of reasoning, uh, K, if uh, it assigns a probability to all events involving uh, the theta and the k minus one -th order beliefs of the other players, uh, but not to high order events. And then an infinite depth of reason, that's the standard framework. So then the belief hierarchy can assign a probability to all events invo involving theta 
and the high order events at any order. So can assign a probability means that uh, the partition or the sigma algebra is fine enough to contain that event. Okay. Uh, can I ask something? Is it possible to have uh, to allow for some players to have infinite depth and some to have finite depth? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can have you can mix and match all the possible depth of reasonings, uh, and it's also possible. For, um, so unlike, for instance, in the level K literature, it can also be the case that everyone has the same depth of reasoning. So it doesn't need to. Be, so in the level K literature, people always think that other people are less sophisticated than they are. You don't need it here. So it's a very general kind of setup. Yeah, so um, so what do I so how do I model this depth of reasoning? So the, here's the example again. So uh, according to the definition I uh, just uh, uh, showed you very informally, um, uh, depth of reasoning too would mean that, uh, for instance, that Bob doesn't reason about Anne's beliefs about it, uh, his beliefs about theta. That's uh, depth too. So he reasons about Anne's beliefs uh, about theta, but not about his beliefs or her. Sorry, her beliefs about his beliefs. And we've seen that that means that he doesn't distinguish uh, between the red belief hierarchies and he doesn't distinguish between the blue hierarchies. Now that uh, for. Um, Formally, that means that his uh, third order belief, where he is, where if he would actually reason up to order three, he would be thinking about uh, Anne's beliefs about uh, uh, his beliefs. That third order belief is defined on the core sigma algebra. So it's the sigma algebra that's generated by a partition into the red hierarchies on the one hand and the blue hierarchies on the others. So this core sigma algebra or the coarse partition, if you will, separates the belief hierarchies um, for n according to the first order beliefs, so the beliefs for n about theta, but they, uh, it lumps them together otherwise. But this sigma algebra generated by this uh, coarse partition is formally equivalent to the sigma algebra generated from the projection function. If I were to project the second order belief hierarchies into the into the first, so that means that essentially what I'm doing is I'm taking uh, the belief hierarchies that can be distinguished in terms of their first order beliefs, and then um, uh, I use that to make a partition of the second order belief hierarchies. And this is something that works very generally. So I could take um, um, at order k plus one, the core is um, um, I could define the k plus one order belief for Bob on a core sigma algebra, namely the one that's uh, generated by this projection function. And this is how I'm, how I'm going to put it into the in the standard framework. So this is what we've just seen. So this is how we model context. So uh, first order belief. So there are restrictions on the first order beliefs and also on the high order beliefs. Now the only thing that I'm adding is these course sigma algebras. So it's um, not necessarily the case that the beliefs for um, uh, for a player are defined on like the standard set of um, uh, possible beliefs about theta and the caved or the beliefs of the other players. But I'm adding uh, possible um, beliefs that are defined on these coarser sigma algebras. And it could be that, um, so it could be that a player stops reasoning at level one, could be that he stops reasoning at level two, uh, all the way up to um, K minus one. So that captures the, so, and the coarser, the, um, uh, or uh, the lower my depth of reasoning, so uh, the lower the order at which I stop kind of like making distinctions between um, uh, the different um, possible belief hierarchies of the other player, the coarser my partition. And then the only th other thing that I need um, is that uh, I also allow for um, players not to reason about the other player at all. So then I'm just lumping together all the possible belief hierarchies of the, of the other player.
So this is actually quite straightforward. It generalizes the, um, the standard merton samir kind of construction. So the merton samir construction is one where uh, all players believe or all the belief hierarchies are defined on the uh, the finest or the largest possible sigma algebras, so the finest partitions. So they have, um, they have an infinite depth of reasoning in my uh, terminology, and there's no context in that um, uh, all the possible coherent hierarchies are uh, included. Yeah, so, uh, so that works and it's uh, straightforward to do. But ideally, we would also like to work with type spaces because in economic applications, we tip, we never, almost never write down belief hierarchies. We work with type spaces. So a question is whether the convenience of um, the type space approach would still be available when players have an infinite depth of reasoning. And that's not quite obvious because um, if you have a standard type space, then um, you have um, a type has belief about uh, has a belief about another type, and that type has belief about the other player's type. So every type automatically unfolds into uh, an infinite belief hierarchy. It would seem. So here's our example again. So um, in the standard case, oh sorry, can I ask you a quick question just a clar clarification for me? So in what you were doing, you had a, a bunch of uh, uh, hierarchies, right? So it was not yeah. just one, it was a bunch of them. And uh, it, then you have the depth being M plus one. Is it that the, all of them have the same depth? No. What? No. So, so it's up. So it's just, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah, so it's just a subset. So it could, they could contain, so it could be that there's, um, uh, there's belief hierarchies that have the finest possible um, uh, sigma algebra. There could be ones with the, uh, that have stopped re uh, reasoning at just k minus one, uh, stopped reasoning at, um, or, uh, sorry, at order k or at k minus one, et cetera. They could stop at order two, even, uh, so at depth two, or they could ne not reason at all. So everything is allowed. So just just a quantifier here of quality. So k is 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 free in in this construction. Uh, the m is free. M is free. Okay. Yeah. So m m can be any number between one and infinity. Is that what it is? Well, this is well. This is just a k or belief. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so in this, like on this slide, k is a free parameter in a way. Uh, so it could vary. Uh, sorry, on this slide, m is the free parameter, but the depth mm -hmm. of reason k could be anything for any belief hierarchy so you yeah, have this, kind of... okay so I, I, after i fix a k this this set uh, that i'm considering constructing here is all hierarchies of depth of depth of reasonings up to k is that correct yeah but this, this is only the k plus one th order belief so my my maximum belief is k okay yeah and then i kind of so this is just kind of this is a, so the hi k plus one consists of sequences of length length k plus one okay. and i construct them in, inductively so they keep growing mm -hmm. and then okay. the um the model contains the uh, the infinite hierarchies of beliefs it's just that some of them uh are effectively finite in a way yeah no that that's very clear i was just just trying to understand whether all of them had the same yeah or not it was it wasn't clear for me that's clear okay yeah no thank you mm. no so um no, it can be arbitrary. Could be all the same. Could all be different. Um, depends very much on the kind of setting, which one makes sense. So the examples that I'm using all have the same depth of reasoning because that uh, takes the least space on a slide. Uh, but it could be arbitrary. Yeah. So we want to work with types. So here's the example again. Um, and in the standard framework, we know that uh, belief hierarchy, there's a one-to-one -one belief uh, uh, relationship between belief hierarchies on the one end and, and types on the other. So these four belief hierarchies from N, those are the, the actual state of the world, if you will. And we're interested in a situation where Bob doesn't reason about N's beliefs about his beliefs. So 
uh, we've seen that um, uh, we can model that by lumping together the, the different uh, belief hierarchies for N. But if, her, uh, if Bob's subjective state space in the belief hierarchy world consists of such a coarse partition that lumps together these belief hierarchies, we could equally well just lump together um, the types for N because in the actual state space, each belief hierarchy corresponds to a type. Um, so coarse partition on the set of belief hierarchies for N, the act her actual belief hierarchies corresponds to a coarse um, uh, partition on uh, the set of types. So the idea is that if Bob has a type that corresponds to a finite depth of reasoning, then that type's belief is going to be defined on a coarse sigma algebra. Now, the tricky thing, of course, is that we need to um, uh, define the sigma algebra in a, uh, in a clever way. Um, so in this example, we've already written out the belief hierarchy. So it's obvious that we uh, which partition we should choose, so which uh, sigma algebra we should choose. Uh, but of course, when we define a type space, we don't want to write out the full belief hierarchies before we can define the, uh, the sigma algebra. That's just not possible. So how can we do that? Well, um, the basic idea is very simple. So it's, it's the same as in the standard setup. So each player, two players, ha uh, uh, has a set of types. And each type has a belief about uh, theta and the other player's type. So uh, belief is a probability measure here. So type Ti has a is associated with probability measure beta I Ti. Now to capture these different depths of reasoning, uh, the typeset for Bob is endowed with a collection of sigma algebra. So in the standard setup, there's just um, a single sigma algebra, but here we want to allow for potentially different sigma algebras. Um, so now there's a collection of sigma algebras. So it's a collection of partitions and each belief for N is defined on one of those sigma algebras. And the idea is that uh, she can assign a probability to any event in that sigma algebra, but not about other events. And of course, the same if we, uh, uh, the same for Bob. Now, here's an example of how this might work. So here's a very simple uh, type space. Um, so the red one, uh, the red tables are all for N, and the blue ones are for Bob. So N has uh, four types, TA1, TA2, TA3, TA4. And likewise, Bob has four types. Now in type TA1 assigns a probability one to the event that uh, theta is high and to Bob having type TB1 or TB2. That's what this notation indicates. And TA2, for instance, uh, assigns probability one also to the state of nature being high. So theta is high and to Bob having type TB3 TB3 or TB4, and so on. So type TA1 believes, so assigns probability one to the state of nature being high. So theta is high uh, because all the mass is in this uh, column on the, uh, on the left. And uh, type TA1 also assigns probability one to Bob assigning probability one to the state of nature being high because both TB1 and TB2 um, assign probability one to the state of nature being high. So that's just the same as in the standard framework. But the trick here is that TB1 and TB2, uh, they, uh, even though they have the same belief about the state of nature, uh, because both assign probability one to theta is uh, high, they have different beliefs about and beliefs about the state of nature because TB1 assigns probability one um, um, to N having type TA1, TA2, or TA2, and both of which assign uh, probability one um, to the state of nature being high. But uh, TB2 assigns probability one to N having type TA3 or TA4, and those types for N think that the state of nature is low. So that means that N has a, a, a type TA1 for N, has a well-defined um, belief about 
the state of nature and about Bob's belief about the state of nature. But uh, she cannot make very precise statements about um, Bob's beliefs about Anne's beliefs about the state of nature. Now, in this example, all the uh, types have the same um, sigma algebra, or the same partition, so the same depth of reasoning also. Um, but that's not necessary, I should say. Now, of course, I chose these partitions or um, sigma algebra, so the TA1, uh, TA2 versus TA3, TA4. I chose that in a particular way. Um, and you can imagine that I cannot choose those arbitrarily. That if I choose, if I, for instance, if I lump together TA1 and TA3 for um, um, uh, Bob Sigma algebra, then Bob might not have a, a very well defined belief. So, how to, so we need some extra conditions to make sure that every type has a well defined depth of reasoning. And one way, uh, one clue we could get from uh, looking at the standard framework, so a Harzani type space, the type space is introduced by Harzani. So um, very, very similar in that each player has a set of types and each type is associated with a belief about uh, theta and the other player's type. Now, of course, in the standard Harzani framework, all uh, types have the same very fine partition. Um, so in particular, if the um, if all players have a, uh, finitely many types, then these partitions are uh, the discrete ones. So the, the sigma algebras contain all possible subsets. Um, but there is a clue, namely that um, so that there is this extra condition that uh, that doesn't have a counterpart in the the definition I gave you for the finite de de reasoning case. And namely, that is that these mappings from types to beliefs, so the beta A, beta B, those need to be measurable, because otherwise you won't be able to get. Uh, it won't be the case that every belief hierarchy, uh, sorry, every type defines um, induces a well-defined belief hierarchy. So essentially, what we're looking for is a generalization of this measurability condition, because we want to be able to uh, model types that have a finite depth of reasoning, but also potentially infinitely uh, types with an infinite depth of reasoning. So um, how can we do that? Well, um, we need a new definition. Um, so a sigma algebra on Bob's type set dominates sigma algebra on Ant's type set. If the sigma algebra on Bob's type set separates the types for Bob, so makes distinction between Bob's types, according to the uh, belief that they have on uh, about the state of nature and uh, and types as distinguished by this uh, sigma algebra on n's type. So the idea is that if a type for n has the sigma algebra fb, so this uh, sigma algebra on Bob's type set, then n's type can reason about Bob's beliefs about theta because um, this sigma algebra on Bob's type separates Bob's types according to their beliefs on uh, uh, the sigma algebra on theta, and also about Anne's beliefs as they can be expressed in this uh, sigma algebra. And it's potentially a core sigma algebra. So why does that work? Well, the course is possible sigma algebra is the trivial one, which just lumps together um, all types for n. So that's the TA empty set that you see here. And now suppose that there's a sigma algebra um, on Bob's type set, this FB2. Um, and suppose that this sigma algebra dominates this trivial sigma algebra on n's type set. Now, if a type for n has this sigma algebra FB2, then this type reasons about Bob's beliefs about theta because this FB2 separates Bob's types according to uh, uh, bo uh, separates Bob's types according to their beliefs on, on uh, the sigma algebra on uh, theta. So a type for n with this sigma algebra FA can reason about Bob's beliefs about theta 
but because um, um, but it might not be able to reason about it might not be able to make any sensible distinction between uh, types for n because it's uh, uh, um, sorry it might not be able to say anything sensible about uh, Bob's beliefs about n's type because um, it dominates only the trivial sigma algebra. Now, if we go a level further, so if we have a sigma algebra on n's type set, so that's a sigma algebra associated with the type for Bob, and suppose it dominates this sigma algebra FB2, that's uh, in turn dominates this trivial sigma algebra on n's type set, then a type for Bob that is associated with this FA3, that type for Bob reasons about and beliefs about Bob's beliefs about theta. So the more sigma algebras you dominate in a way, the more um, the higher you can, uh, the higher your depth of reasoning. And of course, you can continue that, and you can do it for both players, and that gives you different depths of reasoning. Sorry, the yeah, clarification about the notation. So, uh, so basically, the very first uh, bullet point. So this says that. Um, and can reason at least about Bob's beliefs of data, yeah. right? She may be able to, to reason about more stuff than that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you for that. I kind of brushed it under the uh, carpet, uh, but it means that she can at least reason about that. And FA3 can reason about uh, at least uh, Anne's beliefs about Bob's beliefs. Yeah. So FB2 has depth. At, the way I've written it up here is... Um, uh, would suggest it's uh, at, at least depth of reasoning too, um, but I'm kind of yeah brushing yeah brushing it under the carpet. Yeah. So this kind of construction gives you um, all finite uh, belief hier or all belief hierarchies with a finite depth of reasoning. If you want to get an in infinite depth of reasoning, well. Um, you get an infinite depth of reasoning if you have a belief hierarchy that is for n, um, sorry, sorry, a sigma algebra on n's type set that separates um, the types for n according to their beliefs on a sigma algebra that um, for Bob, that is then again separates the types for Bob according to their beliefs on the original sigma algebra and so on and so forth. So you get some kind of fixed point, if you will, in terms of the belief hierarchy. So uh, my belief hierarchy is fine enough to completely uh, reason about your, um, not sorry, my sigma algebra is fine enough to reason completely about your sigma algebra and vice versa. And that gives us the condition that we need. So we need an, so if you have one of those sigma, so one of those sigma algebras uh, that is in the collection of potential, uh, sigma algebras, unless it's the trivial one. There is another, there's a sigma algebra on the, um, the type set for the other player, such that my sigma algebra dominates that one. Um, or it's the case that my sigma algebra dominates your sigma algebra and vice versa. And this latter one is precisely the measurability condition for the Hazani type spaces. Now, this star that's precisely um, the, what Marciano um, um, asked about. So um, it needs to be the case that uh, my sigma, it's not just that my sigma algebra dominates your sigma algebra, it also needs to be the, uh, the coarsest one uh, that does so. And uh, you, um, if you do that, then uh, what I just said on the on the other slide is actually, uh, is not, um, yeah, gives you the exact depth of reasoning. Uh, and the reason why uh, we need it is that um, why I need it is that uh, if you don't have it, you have some kind of redundancy, um, which is unproblematic in many ways in the standard Harzani framework. But in this setup, it could give you an ill-defined depth of reasoning. So it could be that, um, uh, yeah, I don't. My sigma algebra doesn't dominate a particular sigma algebra of yours, but nevertheless, I can still reason about all the events that matter. And that gets, yeah. And of course, then there, yeah, there could be an, uh, other redundancies at other levels and uh, there's no well-defined depth of reasoning anymore. 
I mean, uh, maybe what I'm asking is exactly what you're saying. So in, in this picture here, things seem to go five, four, three, two, one, right? And uh, it's, uh, like uh, the, the fifth one connects to the fourth, that connects to the third and two and second and so on. Could you have gaps? Uh, so yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, yeah. So in the sense that um, uh, there could be gaps in that the sigma algebra are simply not included. Um, okay. Oh, wait. So, no, sorry. No, sorry. The, the, the definition doesn't allow for it. So there needs to be a sigma algebra included in the um, uh, in this collection of potential sigma algebras, but there doesn't need to be a type associated with it. So it could be that you have a, you reason up to order five, and I reason up to order one. That's allowed. And that, I mean, all your types have depth of reasoning five, and all my types have depth of reasoning one. Okay. Which is probably an accurate uh, description, I guess, of reality, but never mind. Um, yeah, so the definition requires the sigma algebras to be present. That's more for, yeah, conv yeah convenience in a way than for anything else, I think. But it can only it's it's only a virtual. It could be that there's a gap in that uh, these are only virtual orders of reasoning, and that there's no type present that actually has that order. They're merely included for yeah bookkeeping. William Yen, you have about ten minutes left. Huh? Oh, okay. Ooh. <laughs> now, uh, but uh, yeah. So this is the um, uh, the formal definition of a type space. So. Um, it satisfies this uh, condition. Uh, the separation condition also separates uh, a technical con condition. And with that, every type gives you a belief hierarchy of a well-defined depth. And uh, the depth of a finite type is uh, determined precisely by uh, which sigma algebra it dominates. Yeah, let me just note that with this framework, it is indeed the case that types can, um, of a finite depth can reason precisely about high order events uh, when these um, high order events can be expressed in a low order events. So I can reason about the event that we have eye contact, even though my depth is only order K, precisely if um, this eye order event can be expressed in, an, in terms of my K, in your, in terms of K minus one order beliefs. And that's precisely the idea of David Lewis. So uh, David Lewis is the philosopher that introduced the idea of common knowledge. Um, and he noted that common knowledge was in, uh, unproblematic in that it's a chain of implications, but not of, uh, but not but it's not a chain of steps in someone's actual reasoning. So according to David Lewis, there's nothing improper about the infinite length of uh, that's required to model common knowledge. Yeah. So I might have, yeah, um, I'm going to skip this part with apologies to Marciano, I think. Because um, I want to yeah, tell that's you. that's exactly about... what I wanted to ask you, my question, <laughs> but that's okay. I'll ask you offline. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, because I wanted to talk to um, talk about terminal type spaces. So uh, terminal type spaces, type space that embeds all type spaces in a way. So they're used in robustness analysis. So uh, the Weinstein Yildiz work uh, works with uh, the terminal type space of um, Mertens and Zamir, and uh, it perturbs belief hierarchies in that space. So, um, and then it's important to have uh, all type spaces present, if you will. It's also used commonly in uh, epistemic uh, work. And importantly, the, tip, the typical way you prove that uh, it's without loss of generality to, uh, to work with types is to construct a terminal type space. Now, we know it exists for Hazani type spaces, so uh, I already referenced Mertens and Zemir, but there's also important work by lots of other people, including Brandenburger and Deco and Heifetz and Samet. Um, so what is this terminal type space? So... Um, for that, we need to uh, talk about um, uh, uh, type morphism. So, a type. So, what it means for a type space to be embedded in another one. Now, Mertens and Amir defined um, it in the following way. So, a type space can be embedded in a type space as a belief closed subspace if there's a type morphism. So, something that preserves 
the beliefs of the players, including their depth of reasoning in this case, but also the, uh, the belief of the, um, uh, that's associated with this embedding has to have support uh, within this, um, uh, yeah, within the image of the, uh, under the embedding. And then uh, Mertens and Samir said, well, take a class of type spaces. So for instance, there are any type spaces where every player has an infinite depth of reasoning. Then a particular uh, type space is terminal for this class. If every type space in this class can be embedded in this terminal type space as a belief closed subspace. Now, and the result is there is no such terminal type space. And I'm going to skip over the proof, but it's very, very simple. It's extremely simple. And the basic idea is that um, there's no type space or for that matter, model of belief hierarchies that can simultaneously model all restrictions on players' beliefs. And the idea is precisely that if you have a type space, um, um, so say um, uh, a potential terminal type space, then in a way it cannot rule out certain beliefs because it has to model all possible beliefs. But if it doesn't rule out certain beliefs, then it cannot model situations where players do rule out these beliefs. And that's precisely the idea of the proof. Now, you might worry about this um, because like I said, terminal type spaces are pretty um, um, essential in, uh, in lots of uh, fields in game theory. But uh, at the same time, there's no problem. I would argue there's no problem in that um, uh, you do, there is a complete type spa uh, space, which is essentially the analog of the um, universal type space of uh, Mertens and Samir. And that's something that you need in, um, that, that is often used in epistemic game theory. Um, and importantly, um, the fact that there's no terminal type space doesn't mean it's without loss of generality. Uh, sorry, it doesn't mean that it's with loss of generality to work type spaces because they are in fact equally expressive. So uh, I'm not going to show you the proof, but um, let me just note that um, what I mean, what, let me just note what exactly I mean by it. Well, if we have a type space, then I can find a model. So a, a set of belief hierarchies uh, such that they are uh, they are the same from the perspective of high order beliefs. And that's something I call belief isomorphic. And conversely, for every model so of belief hierarchies, there is a type space such that the two are isomorphic. So the same in terms of uh, high order beliefs. And that means that it's not just the case that every type generates a belief hierarchy, which is something that we've already seen, but the converse is also true. So if you have a belief hierarchy, I can find a type. Yeah, so let me just wrap up. So uh, Deco and Siniskalki uh, noted that uh, in the standard framework, um, we care about belief hierarchies and these different types spaces, um, those are just convenient devices for modeling uh, these belief hierarchies. So it might be convenient to write down a small type space because that's all we need. But um, these type spaces are nested and uh, the belief hierarchy doesn't depend on um, which type space we're considering. So asking whether a player's belief hierarchy resides in one type structure or another, so the smaller one or a bigger one, is meaningless. Now, if there's a finite depth of reasoning, then all of a sudden the context does matter because um, then we get this problem that uh, a big type space doesn't rule out uh, certain beliefs that are ruled out by the small type space. And that means uh, uh, we don't get this, um, uh, we don't get this um, terminal type space. And uh, also in the, the context of behavior, which I skipped, is that if I want to model, if I want to find the rationalizable strategies, I have to consider all models. I cannot just look at kind of like the, um, the big uh, type space as you would do in the, in the standard um, Mertensen year setup. 
So I would argue also that if context matters, um, robustness also becomes more complicated. So in the standard Hazanyi framework, um, um, you can easily perturb these belief hierarchies. So in the Mert you work within the Mertin Samir type space, like um, Weinstein and Yildiz, for instance, and then um, you can perturb these high order beliefs quite easily. But if you take the idea of context seriously, then you have to um, perturb an actual um, physical situation that imposes restrictions on our beliefs. And these physical situations uh, can look quite different. So the linguist Clark and Marshalls have some wonderful examples of this kind, but you can already see it in the context of the electronic mail game of um, Rubinstein, where you have these two generals sitting each on their hills and they're sending uh, messages to each other, and where it's um, mutual belief up to very high order that the enemy is weak. Well, that would be very, so that's, but not common, uh, common belief that the enemy is weak. That's physically very different from uh, the general sitting on the same hill and observing together that the enemy is weak. So if the context matters, it's not so easy to um, perturb belief hierarchies. And formally in this setup, you can see that um, by having, uh, by the fact that there are these different models or type spaces that are not nested. And an interesting question that I'm currently thinking about is, well, I've modeled the settings with a finite depth of reasoning because that kind of is a natural starting point. Um, um, given the level K um, cognitive hierarchy literature, but the same kind of ideas seem to apply much more generally. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Marchan and Paolo if they have questions. I guess this could be an opportunity to cover some of the stuff that Marciano was keen on. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> Sorry, maybe Paolo, let, let Paolo get, get in first. Maybe he does, he's not interested in that stuff. I don't know. Well, I am, I am. But just just because you well, I mean, okay, for first of all, fantastic. You know, I, I like this project quite a bit. But because you had you had to, to hurry up at the end, something wasn't clear to me. Maybe you could explain. So you said, okay, there is no universal space, no terminal space. We understood that. But then you went quickly and you had this uh, union of all type spaces or, or something. There was a big union over there. And with what I understood was that, uh, you know, because uh, you show that hierarchies and types are isomorphic, you don't lose anything going from one to the other. I'm wondering, don't you have everything that you need? I mean, so what's the what's the big deal with this universal type space? Uh, yeah, fetish. No, that's you a already fair question. Mm -hmm. Tell me. Yeah, no, that's a fair question. So, in a, I mean, I guess the point is, um, uh, Merton Sazimir did, did way too much, and people started to think about um, uh, um, the question of whether belief hierarchies and types are equally expressive in those terms. But this is an alternative proof method. So you don't need this kind of uh, terminal type spaces to, to make that point. Um, and that's, um, and the reason why it doesn't work is very intuitive because of this, yeah, big type space doesn't rule out what is, ruled, uh, what is, um, ruled out by the small type spaces. And in particular, that's an issue that has come up also in the context of lexicographic, uh, probability systems, but that's something that Marciano knows much more about than I do. Mm -hmm. Um, so one question that I'm currently thinking about is why is that an issue with the lexicographic probability systems, but not by the, uh, with the conditional probability systems? Because mm -hmm. essentially, yeah. Because the idea, uh, yeah. The, an issue with conditional probability systems as well. Okay. So the issue is with forward induction. Ah, interesting. I did not, okay, thank you. I, I was gonna ask you about, I mean, this is a long conversation. So I'm, I'm sorry, but uh, Paolo, you should, uh, you should continue. No, it's just going to finish up because you know you because then you link that to robustness and so on, and you know nothing precludes you to finding uh, a notion of uh, distance in, in in that big union that you, of yours. Oh, actually, I I don't have a big union. Okay, so Isn't I can. Sure? I, oh well, I I mean there is the complete type space. I mean. Uh -huh. Yeah, so there is the, the complete type space is in a way the, the analog of the, um, the Merton Sensimir type space. Mm -hmm. But if you're interested in behavior, uh, this big union doesn't give you all the possible uh, behavior, whereas in the Merton Sensimir oh. context, it does. 
So if I do okay. interim coordinator, yeah. yeah. So yeah, so the next question is well, that's how you define uh, distance, right? By behavior. But anyways, yeah. later. <laughs> yeah. No, that's Jana, exactly right. Yeah. Yeah, so a couple of things. So first of all, I mean, one problem in this literature, you know, at least for, you know, for people who haven't been, you know, who are keen on it for 25 years, is that there are so many different notions of a big type space or a rich type space. Right? Yeah. And so you mentioned termi uh, terminality, of course. Um, uh, you mentioned completeness, by which I mean, I, I, I assume you mean that the betas are on to. Yeah. Right, and so there, the existence you get by is just by topological arguments, essentially. No, so, no construction, because it, uh, I can just uh, construct the analog of the metans and Zemir type space, which is on, which indeed the mappings are onto. And okay, I but then okay, but then you're proving my, but that was actually my question. So you're actually proving much more. You're, you're proving that there exists a canonical type structure. Yeah. Yeah. So even right. that. Yeah. So uh, exactly, because the, the existence of a complete type structure, I mean, I could, could imagine how one would do it uh, just using, you know, the usual Polish space, space trick or something like that, but you're actually yeah. doing more. Okay, so you do have a, so that's it. So you do have a canonical type structure, but that canonical type structure is not terminal. Yeah, that's correct. Because otherwise, right, because uh, you, you prove that there is no, and that, yeah. so that is kind of, um, that is kind of puzzling because one would imagine, one could say, okay, so I'm going to start with a type structure. I'm going to look at the resulting belief hierarchies, some of which may have finite depth of reasoning, but that's okay. Uh, by definition, the canonical type structure is going to have those belief hierarchies, right? And so what breaks in this construction? Yeah. So maybe I should I should share the, the, the proof sketch with you. Go ahead, okay. go ahead. Yeah, because it's actually, it's a very simple uh, proof by example. It's, um, uh -huh. so what, so um, what breaks? Yeah, here it is. So suppose, so it's a proof by contradiction. Suppose that we did find our magical terminal type space, T star, and it's terminal for the set of all possible belief hierarchies, uh, sorry, for the set of all possible type spaces. Uh, so infinite depth of reasoning, finite depth of reasoning. Uh, and I'm going to show that there's two type spaces that cannot be both be embedded in this uh, uh, candidate terminal type space. So one is the one that's on the left. Now there's nothing special, uh, uh, sorry, on the right. There's nothing special about this, I should say. Uh, I chose it because it's very similar to the example that I showed you previously. Okay. Uh, it's a slight modification of it, but again, every type has a, a depth of reasoning too, just two types, um, yeah and just four types. Uh, it's just that the beliefs are no longer degenerate and that's, but that's the only difference. And uh, the other type space uh, can be arbitrary. So the T tilde, the only thing that I'm asking is that it includes a particular type. Um, and this canonical type space would have this uh, type, but there's okay. plenty of others that would have this type. So what is important, um, well, this TA1 uh, on the right, uh, the red one on the one, um, uh, the red type on the right, that type rules out that Bob assigns probability one to Anne assigning probability one to the state of nature being high. Because uh, all the types for Bob put probability one on types for Anne that have non-degenerate beliefs about theta. So in this particular context on the right, that one is ruled out. But in the type space T tilde on the left, there is such a type for Bob. So TA1, so if, sorry, so this type space, the big uh, candidate uh, type space uh, T star simultaneously have to has to rule out that Bob believes that N believes that uh, theta is high, um, but it also has to allow for it. So that's the problem. It's the same, I think it's the same problem that you get with LPS. Uh, okay, I'm too slow to uh, follow this example. We should we should continue offline. Can okay. I can I ask you just one last question, for Francesco? Is that okay if I ask one last yeah. question? Okay. Can you uh, put I uh, put the 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 game example? Yeah. It's actually oh, yeah. A very very quick question. So. Um, 
Sure. Yeah, and I think people can follow it even if uh, I didn't fully. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. so 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 here's the thing. Uh, when you're saying, actually, can can you? Uh, no, actually, no, this this is the the right one. So, uh, what? So here, uh, players do not reason about the others' beliefs. Yeah. Okay? Very good. But now you're saying uh, type T three A can think that Bob rationally chooses L. Now, rationality, as I think about it, is a restriction on strategies and beliefs. Yeah. And so I can't even define the event that Bob is rational if I don't have, if I cannot think of beliefs. No, that's, yeah. And I think that's probably the weak point in this argument. Um, so um, the way you can, so the way it's, so um, the way I, allowing for it is the is of course in the definition for uh, interim correlated rationalizability so the definition is entirely standard you don't need to re uh, read it except that the conjecture that players have about other players so this alpha minus i needs to be measurable and then you need best responses so in this example uh, there's very few strategies that are uh, conjectures that are measurable because uh, each type has such a coarse sigma algebra. Right. Um, but every type, I mean, so rational just means best response given your belief at level one. So the first level in the rationalizability, I just need to be playing best response to um, uh, my belief about theta. Now for every uh, possible type, L is a best response to their belief. Um, I mean, there is a conjecture that's measurable. Um, sure, but, but, but now you're, but this is just a player's belief about data that we're talking about, right? So, and, and, yeah. and the other players that we were talking about. So, no doubt that you can define an iterative procedure that, that does this. But the question is, how can I then provide an epistemic characterization of this if I cannot even define? Yeah a player's second order beliefs and therefore I cannot I cannot define what it means for a player to believe yeah. that the other player is rational. Yeah, true. Um yeah and I think the trick here is that indeed the um the belief hierarchies are defined only on theta as a standard in the interim correlated rationalizability uh, uh literature of except of course uh the more epistemic kind of uh, work like uh, Pierre Paolo. Oh, I see it. You know, I actually remember when we were talking about this. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, because you still, you have a, right. So, so you have, you have full depth of reasoning in terms of the epistemic types. Yeah. Uh, or the beliefs about the strategies, but not, of, the, the restriction here is on the, is on the beliefs yeah. about, yeah. got it, got it. Thanks, yeah. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for reminding yeah. me. <laughs> Getting yeah. old, you know. <laughs> Memory yeah, but uh, I mean, um, so it is, well, it's not quite the infinite depth uh, because it, my conjecture does have to be measurable. Yeah. So, uh, but I can define, so in the way I have defined it, it's, it's, it's at a fixed point. So I can have kind of like um, a conjecture that's um, measurable with respect to this very coarse sigma algebra. Yeah. But nevertheless, everyone is best responding to their belief. So I, you know, I admit it's a, um, it is in a way um, artificial, um, and if indeed if you were uh, if you were to look at uh, kind of like the rationalizability without any uh, uncertainty about the state of nature, so just RCBR, um, you don't get this particular kind. Yeah, of... yeah, no, but but there's there's no problem again because here we're just uh, you know we're we're not doing the epistemic exercise here, yeah. so we don't exactly. actually. And if we were, we would actually run roll out the full belief yeah. hierarchies about the epistemic types, but under yeah. this restriction that players cannot reason about the data. Yeah. I, I yeah. Right. So, um, so this example is no problem for. I mean, doesn't raise any kind of like epistemic issues. It's more yeah. about the robustness literature. Yeah. And um, and indeed, so. Um, and that was kind of the point of this quote I, I put yeah. pulled from your paper. Uh, that's like in in terms of the robustness literature, you can just work with the Mertens and Zemir type space, 
and you don't care like whether you're looking at a particular belief closed subset of that uh, Merton Samir. Yeah, although method. again, that issue does apply to the dynamic robust mechanism design literature, right? So it's not, um, you know, uh, I'm not sure I was the one who wrote that sentence. <laughs> <laughs> okay, never mind. Thank you. Yeah. Thank well, you very thank much you. for a great talk. Well, thank okay. you. It's actually the end of a formal part. We're going to stop uh, recording. I'm, I'm going to do that. Um, so thank you very much, Willem and uh, Marciano and Paolo. Uh, but, you know,